this video, I'm going to react to the Fallen of World War II. Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Kabir Considers. This is the place where I react to music, media, sports, anime, anything related to popular culture. I'll watch it with an open mind and give you my 100% honest reaction to it. And if you could please hit that like button early, I'd really, really appreciate it. Now, this should be a truly interesting video. And to be honest, I imagine it's gonna be a fairly somber one as well, just because World War II, from, from what I know about it, the casualties were enormous. I mean, relative to the population of the planet at the time, I think it's one of the, if not the deadliest human conflicts ever. And this video, when it was recommended to me, I knew I had to watch it, you know, quite soon, just because it's really gonna crystallize just how devastating it was, you know. I think if I if I had to put a number on it, I, what, what didn't the numbers, it was over 80 million people or something like that, total casualties. But yeah, uh, it's just an absolute horrific event that, you know, I hope is never repeated. But yeah, this video is gonna be a really interesting one. So let's go. This is gonna be me reacting to the Fallen of World War II. Let's do it. The average lifespan of an American is 80 years. And an 80 year old today was 10 when World War II ended, mm. four when it began. A soldier who saw battle would have to be in his late 80s, at least today. Mm. Generals, political leaders, the decision makers of the war, few are still with us. And over the past few decades, we've seen authors and filmmakers rush to capture stories from survivors before this connection of memory is lost. Mm. This project is not about individual war stories, and it's not about survivors. We're gonna tally up the tens of millions of people whose lives are cut short by the war, and see how these numbers stack up to other wars in history, including trends in recent conflicts. We'll be counting soldiers and civilians separately. Each of these figures represents 1,000 people who died. Wow. Civilians were of all walks of life. Whereas military deaths were almost entirely men. The average age was about 23. 23, I mean, that is just such a young person. You know, imagine like, <sighs> you've got so much life left to live. You know, you've got so many things, so many memories, so many places, you know, Oh, to, to die at that age is just a tragedy, honestly. In most battles, for every 1,000 soldiers killed, there are more than 1,000 who are injured. The word casualty can be confusing because in military speak, it often includes both deaths and injuries and anything else that takes a soldier out of service. Here, we're just counting the deaths and we'll begin with American soldiers. Over 400,000 died. Most of the deaths occurred in the European theater, fighting the Nazis. And about a quarter were in the Pacific, fighting the Japanese. When you put them on the timeline, you see that casualties were the heaviest at the end of the war. Really? The war began on September 1st, 1939. But the U.S. wasn't willing to join the fight until Pearl Harbor, two years in. The deaths increased drastically on D-Day, when the Allies invaded Normandy. One of the most tragic moments of the war was on D-Day at Omaha Beach, where 2,500 Americans fell. Wow. So about the same number of US soldiers died on this single beach landing as the entire 13 years of the recent war in Afghanistan. Wow. The bloodiest battle in the Pacific was Okinawa, 
which lasted 82 days, during which 12,500 Americans died. About 5,000 of these deaths were at sea from kamikaze attacks. So kamikaze attacks are when uh, a pilot or, yeah, I believe it was a Japanese pilot would just fly their plane into, you know, the opposition. It's crazy. Now let's look at some other countries, starting with Europe. Germany started World War II when it invaded Poland. Poland ultimately lost 200,000 soldiers in the war. Most died after the invasion while the country was occupied by Germany and the Soviet Union. Germany, meanwhile, lost just 16,000 in the invasion of Poland. The Nazis went on to invade and conquer other countries, including Denmark, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Greece, and Yugoslavia. France surrendered, but after losing 92,000 soldiers in the Battle of France. Over 200,000 ultimately fell, which includes deaths in POW camps, French colonies, and other fighting. Yugoslavia suffered almost half a million military deaths. Oh. The initial invasion brought relatively few casualties on both sides. But the deaths mounted under Nazi occupation due to guerrilla fighting, civil conflict, and mass executions. And th this, the thing that he's not mentioned yet is the populations of these countries at that time was just so much lower. Like France, I believe the population of France now is somewhere around, I believe, 50 million. Back then, it probably was less than half that. So it would be like, you know, I think they, he said France lost 96,000 there. It'd be like losing 200,000 people. That is a lot. That's like a city. Crazy. The Nazi invasions were swift, with relatively few German losses. Even the Nazi commanders expressed surprise at their success. And then we have the United Kingdom and the United States, who were not invaded, but took the fight to the Nazis. Britain lost about the same number of soldiers as the US, which includes the British colonies. Germany lost about half a million soldiers fighting the US and Britain in what is known as the Western Front, which took place in France and Belgium. But most Nazi soldiers died in the Eastern Front, Germany's unsuccessful invasion of the Soviet Union. The numbers are staggering. The most famous battle of the Eastern Front, and perhaps the turning point of the European war, was Stalingrad. The German Sixth Army successfully took Stalingrad, but then got surrounded by the Soviets and cut off from food and ammunition. Half a million Nazis would ultimately die in Stalingrad. Another 100,000 were taken prisoner, of which 6,000 would ever return. POWs had a low survival rate throughout World War II, and it was particularly grim in the East. When you include these POWs, roughly the same number of Germans died in Stalingrad as all the Western Front fighting against France, the UK, and the US. Good grief. And though Stalingrad was a victory for the Soviets, they suffered almost twice as many losses as Germany. The Soviet Union would eventually defeat the once unstoppable German army, killing 2.3 million Nazi soldiers. Wow. But winning the war came at a cost. I mean, I'm just, I'm just, like, just seeing the way this pillar just keeps getting taller and taller is blowing my mind because, you know, you have to remember that each one of these little things here represents a thousand people. Right, that's a thousand potential bloodlines ended. You know, uh, families ended potentially. Could be the only child of that family. I mean, oh, just war is not like there's nothing. You know, it's just it's just not a good thing. It's not a good thing at all. Man, oh man.
goodness gracious me. When is it going to end? Eight point seven million is the official tally by the Russian military, a hotly disputed number. Some studies have calculated as many as fourteen million dead. To complete the count of European military deaths, we need to add German deaths from other fronts, including the North and Africa, as well as deaths from other Axis powers allied with the Nazis, Hungary, Romania, and Italy. When you put these European military deaths on the timeline, it looks like this. You can now interact with the chart to learn more. Pause the narration if you'd like more time. And now we switch to civilian deaths in Europe. I'm guessing this is going to be potentially even worse, right? Like, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I've got a feeling it's going to be even worse. Six million Jewish people were killed in the Holocaust. If you separate this by country, you see that about half, 2.7 million, were Polish. 700,000 were Soviets, followed by Hungary and 17 other countries. Wow. Broken down another way, about half of the six million were killed in the concentration camps. Over a million died in Auschwitz. Most were killed in the gas chambers. Others died from starvation, exhaustion, disease, and other forms of execution. The second most deadly camp was Treblinka, which was exclusively an extermination camp, set up to look like a train station. Mobile killing groups killed 1.4 million Jews. Like with the gas chambers, men were killed first to reduce the risk of revolt. Man. The Holocaust also includes non-Jewish deaths. Between 130,000 to 500,000 Roma, then called gypsies, were killed. The numbers are disputed. About a quarter million people with disabilities were killed. Homosexuals, Catholics, and other groups were also exterminated, but their numbers were relatively small. Some historians say that other civilian deaths should go under the label of Holocaust. About two million non-Jewish Poles were killed under German occupation. Some of it were sent to the gas chambers at Auschwitz. When you combine civilian and military deaths, over 16% of the total Polish population died in World War II, which is the- 16%, this is what I mean. That is a big chunk of the population of a country. Oh, wow. That would be like, so the population of America is about, is it 300 million, something like that? So that would be, like if 4.5, no, 45 million Americans. Oh my God. The highest percentage of any country. But not the highest in total death count. The Soviet Union again tops that list, losing at least as many civilians as it did soldiers. Somewhere between 10 and 20 million. Man, the Soviet Union A particularly got... dark moment for the Soviet Union was the siege of Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. German forces surrounded Leningrad before civilians could be evacuated. Supplies, including food, were cut off for two and a half years. One and a half million people died as a result, oh. mostly from starvation, mostly civilians. Stalin's cruelty to- That is just so cruel, man. Oh my God, just so barbaric. Ugh. I can't imagine the horrors of what went on. If you're so hungry, you'd probably consider eating anything. Oh my God, Ooh. Oh, Yeah, that's just, that's just horrible to think about. Towards his own people, is partly responsible for these numbers. He often didn't allow civilians to evacuate from cities, thinking it would cause the soldiers protecting them to fight harder. About a million Soviets died in Stalin's own labor camps called the Gulag. 
Just about every country suffered civilian losses, especially countries who were invaded. While many died as a result of so-called collateral damage, the biggest numbers occurred when it was no accident. Civilians were exterminated, purposely fired upon or bombed, used as human shields, or intentionally deprived of food. The intentional killing of civilians was done by most warring parties, including the United Kingdom and the United States. The United Kingdom was spared of a land invasion, but still lost 60,000 civilians, largely from German air raids or blitzes, often directed at civilian population centers. The UK did the same to German cities at a much greater magnitude, causing about 10 times the number of deaths. But most German civilian deaths came from the ground at the late stage of the war. When the Nazi regime collapsed, civilians living in occupied regions had to desperately flee from the advancing Soviet army. For widespread, and death estimates ranged from 600,000 to 3 million. Let's step back and see where we are with the totals. We just counted about 20 million civilian deaths in Europe. If you add this to the European military deaths we already covered, it brings us to over 40 million. Oh, wow. Then we have the Asian theater. Here we see the vast majority of military deaths in Asia came from China and Japan. On the civilian side, about 6 million deaths from China, Indonesia, Korea, Indochina, and the Philippines can be attributed to Japanese war crimes, which are sometimes compared to the Nazi atrocities due to the sheer scale of the cruelty. China had the second highest death count after the Soviet Union. And like the Soviets, the Chinese government demonstrated a stunning willingness to sacrifice its own people. Chinese nationalists opened the dike at the Yellow River, hoping the flood would halt the Japanese advance. Half a million Chinese civilians or more were killed, which is two or three times the number who died in all countries in the 2004 Asian tsunamis. But the invasion of China only cost Japan 200,000 soldiers. Most were killed fighting the US and allies in the Pacific War. A significant portion of Japanese civilian deaths were caused by American firebombing and the two nuclear attacks. Contrary to official U.S. statements, these airstrikes were directed at civilian populations, not military targets. When you add all the deaths outside of Europe, it brings us to a grand total of 70 million for the war, oh. give or take depending on who's counting and what civilian deaths get included. Big number. More people died in World War II than in any other war in history. For comparison, here are 20 or so of the very worst wars and atrocities we have on record. Some of these are more of atrocities than wars, but we've seen how that distinction can get blurry. Some of these spanned across centuries. World War II had the highest body count, and it all happened in just six years. Just an absolute massacre. Ugh, 70 million, that is, that's like, a fairly large country getting wiped out. The world's population has grown significantly since the earliest atrocities on this list. If you want to compare them in terms of what percentage of the world died, we can adjust the chart to look like this. This rough approximation tells us there may have been more devastating wars before World War II, proportionally speaking. When we turn to post-war conflicts, it's hard to say anything that isn't controversial. But the data shows something quite extraordinary has been happening. In 1989, John Gaddis coined the phrase, the long peace, to identify the absence of conflict between the nuclear powers during the Cold War. 25 years later, the Cold War is over, and the term is still being used, although its meaning may have shifted. European countries have not fought each other, except for this 10-day war in 1956 when the Soviet Union invaded Hungary. When we look at European wars before World War II, it looks like this. They tend to be more frequent as you go back, though smaller in scale. And the largest 44 economies of the world have not battled each other since World War II. Thank goodness, but I've got an eerie feeling, you know, it's, you know, it, 
it could he's going to say something along the lines of maybe we're heading to something potentially even bigger or or worse i hope he doesn't say that but i've got a, i've got a nasty feeling he's going to say something along those lines rich countries have fought poor countries like the us versus iraq but rich countries have not fought other rich countries such a period of peace between the so-called great powers hasn't been seen since the roman empire to many peace is too strong of a word wars have occurred since world war 2 and they can be grouped into these four categories we don't see colonial wars anymore we've already noted that interstate wars between rich countries have not occurred at all and here we see wars involving smaller economies have tapered off that leaves civil wars of two types with and without foreign intervention and this is what these battle deaths look like alongside of world war 2 more people died fighting in world war 2 than in all the wars since and again we can't forget about world population which has almost tripled since world war 2 If we scale these numbers to show deaths in proportion to world population, showing the likelihood that a person on earth dies in battle, the downward trend becomes even more pronounced. Now this isn't to infer anything about why this trend is occurring. That's a discussion for another day. You can now interact with this chart to explore what conflicts are behind the totals. Now bear in mind we're just looking at battle deaths here, not civilian deaths. But those I wonder maybe it's because of the um interdependency nations have now with one another obviously you know the export of foods is key with the populations rising and certain nations unable to produce certain food items other essentials gas petroleum things like that that interdependency probably massively discourages you know conflicts if you need to feed your population with produce from some country it's highly unlikely you're going to want to go to war with that country so Yeah, I think maybe the uh, you know, with the 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 rises in infra, in uh, agriculture that we've seen in certain countries and technologies and other things like that, maybe that's one of the key causes of this long peace that we've had. Those two are in decline. Peace is a difficult thing to measure. It's a bit like counting the people who didn't die in wars that never happened. We give such importance to the word peace, but we don't tend to notice it when it occurs or report on it. Sometimes it takes reminding ourselves of how terrible war once was to see the peace that has been growing around us. Of course, this trend may not continue, and it's not clear how looking at these charts can help us make the right decisions to ensure that it does. But the longer the long peace grows, the more significant it becomes. So if watching the news doesn't make us feel hopeful about where things are heading, watching the numbers might. Wow. That was fantastic. What a fantastic video by Neil Hollison, just absolutely amazing. Whoever helped him on this video as well, big kudos, big congratulations to you too. Just fantastically done, well edited. Just World War II, an absolute tragedy that hopefully we never see again. The numbers just boggle the mind. 70 million. Just huge, huge, huge devastating. Oh, I mean, it just I've honestly got chills. I'm pretty speechless after watching that. Just wow. Thanks for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, turn on bell notifications, and keep throwing the recommendations my way. I know I say it all the time, but they genuinely help me out because if I know you enjoyed watching something, I'll definitely enjoy reacting to it. So like, subscribe, turn on bell notifications, keep throwing the recommendations, and I'll catch you in the next one.